You are listening to the Cross Kingdom Sermon of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message from Justin Carpenter. You know, one of, one of, the, uh, one of the Hebrew words for dream means to grow strong. Think about that. And I was, I, as he was talking, I was kind of thinking, you know how when, when you're a kid and you're dreaming and you're, you're, you're literally sound asleep, you're in a dream, and you can do anything in a dream. Like if, if, if you recognize that you're dreaming in that moment, what that's called is lucid. And, and in the world of dreams... There is a place for lucid dreaming. So, I'm going to give you a little nugget. If you have a dream that's based from your soul, and it's a soulless dream, you can actually take authority over it and bring it in under the will of God. If you have a dream that is from the enemy, you can take authority in the dream, and and I've done this, not as often as I would like, I'm still growing in that arena, but when you become lucid that you're dreaming and you're having a dark dream or a black and white dream or it's negative in context and the colors are muted, what you'll see is when you take authority over that dream, then it will actually pop into bright, vivid colors. Um, <clears throat> the world of dreams is not a tangible thing. And so it's taken some time for that to be restored into the Western culture. But if you study the Word, one-third of the Bible is made of dreams and visions. And he promised an increase of those manifestations of the Holy Spirit in the last days. If 2,000 years ago you were in the last days, don't you think you're in the last days? We're in the last days? Maybe? And so, you know, I was every... Every time, the, the last couple of weeks have been absolutely amazing. And, I mean, I don't know about you all, but I, I felt like the worship this morning was just as powerful, but different. And the thing, that what kind of taglines with Josh Motlong's word is, the thing that we've got to do is that next Sunday, when we come together again, don't look for God to move the same way. You, as you study the life of Jesus and the way He brought healing and, and, um, and deliverance to people, He never did it exactly the same way twice. There was always some difference. See, we want to we get a formula. We, we want to put the anointing in a formula because then we feel safer because we think we're in control of something. And every move of God is always... Every outpouring has always stopped in the past because flesh got involved. They, they got into big arguments on whose tent was bigger in the revival days with the tent revivals. Literally, they were measuring the stupid tents. And, and we laugh at that, but we, can, we, we are not infallible. We can get into that same place to where we lose sight. The... <laughs> The greatest treasure of heaven is you. You're the treasure. You're the joy set, set before the Lord. That's why He endured the cross for you. And, and the greatest gift that He gave us next to salvation was His Spirit. The Holy Spirit Himself. You, you absolutely, whether you recognize it or not, you're living in the greatest time of history. You're living in the greatest time of history. And just like in your dreams, you can dream and all things are possible in those dreams. That's, that's for you to be able to grab a hold of the reality that when you wake up, all things are still possible. Do you realize that? I had an encounter some years ago. Um, it was like a five-part encounter. And it was more of a vision than, um, than a dream. And one, one scene of this vision, I was in India. 
and this pastor comes up to me. He's speaking English, and he, we're talking, and he had a tumor on his neck. And in this encounter, I knew this was not the first time I'd been to India. This was not the first time I'd prayed for him, and he was healed. So I knew, like, the cancer came back and was trying to take him out. And in this encounter, I remember, oh, well, healings happen easier, miracles happen easier over here than they do in America. And, and I'm praying, and literally the tumor dissolves under my hand. The scene changes, and I'm standing out in front of an airport. And, oh, but right before that, another pastor comes up. He's speaking in Indy, so I don't have a stinking clue what he's saying to me. But he's speaking in Indy. And he has this poster. The only thing I knew was my name was on that poster, and I was late to speak in a conference. And I know that one day I'll walk this out. Because later on in this vision, one of my closest friends, Stephen Mooney, there was a, like a cave with all these children in like a real deserty wilderness area. And over, over to my left side was Stephen Mooney. And when I shared this encounter with Stephen, he goes, dude, he goes, did you know that I have a heart for the orphans in India? And he is, a, yes, I'm live streaming. He is close to being engaged, I believe, with Priti, and her family is from India, and he just went to India a couple of months ago for the very first time. So you see the fingerprints of God for your dreams and your visions, you're like, oh, wait a minute, here's a timeline. And so pay attention when you have dreams and visions, because there's going to be a timeline sometimes within that dream, and when you get to a certain point within your walk, and all of a sudden you see that fingerprint, you go, okay, it's getting closer. Okay, listen, these are the ways of God that I've been really asking the Lord because there's a word over our house and over my life that we that there'll be a mantle of understanding like the sons of Issachar that we'll know the times and seasons that we're in. And so I've really been pressing into that to know that. But that is over the house. And I believe that that's something that we can press into. But we we have to be aware Like, God's always talking. It's just we're not always tuned to the way that He's speaking. And so, a couple of days ago, uh, the Lord put it on my heart about the issue of forgiveness. And you have to to understand the the way that I think sometimes. I'm thinking, I don't want to repeat the same teaching in a a 12-month calendar period. I, I, I really do think that. And... And so I'm like, but I really felt it strong in my spirit. I'm like, Lord, like, and not only that, when I look back, the last time I taught on forgiveness was January of this year. I'm like, you're really messing me up here because I just talked about this in January. So then I was like, man, maybe I'm not hearing them right. And so I waited. I get a phone call yesterday. We're at the tennis courts for Cole's uh, tennis tournament and then we're at the restaurant, and then we're at the house, and then we're back at the tennis courts, and then I'm over at the baseball field for Micah's baseball practice. Yesterday was a whirlwind, and I didn't have a clue what I was going to teach on today. I'm kind of getting used to that. And, but the night before, it had been weighing on me because I had a dream, and in my dream where the church is in a big gymnasium, Bill Johnson's up there, and he's about to call me up to speak, and my stinking iPad will not open my outline. People, this was very dangerous. I, I had fear that I was not prepared. P- prepared. <laughs> that I was, sorry, I was going into tongues. Um, that, I was, that I was not prepared to get up there. And the dream ended with me trying to get the iPad to work correctly, and this fear hitting me that, oh no, Not only am I not prepared, but Bill Johnson's introducing me. I'm like, it was like the perfect storm in a wrong way. And I I get a phone call yesterday from from Sean Kendrick. He's like, dude, he goes, I just got a question, man. He goes, I'm reading Matthew 18. If you get a chance, read that. And I'd like to ask you a couple of questions on the parable. And then I realize that the parable is on forgiveness. God may, Job says, God, says uh, Job 33, I believe, 
He says, he'll speak in one way or in another, and yet man does not perceive it, right? And so all I knew this week was that God was going to confirm what he wanted me to talk on differently. So I was really staying attentive. And then it just hit me like a bomb. Yes, I want you to talk on forgiveness. But I'm like, Lord, I just talked on forgiveness. And, I'm, and Lisa's like, Justin, so what? <laughs> she was like, can you talk about forgiveness too much? And I'm like, well, no, but, but like it's not, it, it's not logical, right? So I still, even being prophetic, I still wrestle. Like my personality test is like within 10% of being 50-50. So I can get really analytical, really uh, engineer-like on one hand, and I can turn over here and get so out there and creative that you're like, he's lost it. Maybe I never had it, but... But Sean says, how in the world, he goes, Justin, he goes, he goes, I just can't see you having a fear of not being prepared. But it's something I've wrestled with through the years. And, of course, for the Lord to pull that strong down, <laughs> help me, Jesus, <laughs> to pull that stronghold down, he's actually like, I thought I was going to teach, and you all have been here, and all of a sudden, like, I don't even do that, and I just totally shift. And, and some of you apparently think that I'm really good at that, and, and like somehow I've had practice, but no. Like, it's trial by fire. And I share my journey because too many times we have this mindset that ministers somehow are like, like they have a special lane. There, there's not as much trial there's a, there's a, it's a little bit different over here and, and somehow you just break over into this other side. No. Like, you got to choose to punch fear in the face. Right? Yeah. And the, <laughs> the glorious part about teaching is i got to get it first. Like, when he starts talking to me, if my poop's not in a pile, which, by the way, thank you for the pooper scooper cake Wednesday. And... Um, <laughs> And I did get two t-shirts. I was going to wear one this morning, but I thought some might get offended. We created, I created a new logo. It was called Smack the Hell Out of Your Ministries. With a nun. And don't, don't leave. And so some of you people thought it was, would be really funny to get me a gray t-shirt with the logo on it. It's awesome. But I have to be very strategic on where I wear that and when. And my other one was charged hell with a water pistol. I actually wore that yesterday. So, thank you. So, I was telling Sean yesterday that this issue of forgiveness, at the very core of all healing of your heart and all deliverance of the demonic, the very core of it is unforgiveness. It's bitterness. And if you have ill will towards someone in your life, then let's get real. If it's not love, it's what? Hatred. Scripture is very clear that it's hatred that opens us up to the possibility of murder. Like, for real. That's why Jesus said if you have hatred in your heart, you're already guilty of murder. Yeah, that landed. I think my toe crushed. <laughs> because it's easy for us to get a compass in life that is a little bit Word of God and a little bit culture and a little bit philosophy and a, and a little bit just stubbornness, right? But we can begin to view and live from this compass of filters that is blurred. Um, my friends Dan and Ann who have a... Um, Mount Horb House Ministries. Um, Anne, some years ago, did a teaching. And she had these sunglasses. And she put all these little dots on the lenses. And she put the sunglasses on. And she began to talk about perspective and how we view things. So the lenses, or the eyes of your heart, get clouded when we have unforgiveness. One of the things Sean asked about yesterday was like... like, uh, Because Jesus said, if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. Now, I've heard a lot of teachings on forgiveness. 
But when you bring that scripture up, that can open the door to arguing over eternal security in a heartbeat, right? So we kind of don't even step into that arena. Because the question is, well, if you've given your life to Christ and you're sealed with the Holy Spirit, but then you double down on stupid and decide you're going to punish somebody with unforgiveness, which just punishes yourself, does that mean all of a sudden you lost your salvation? There are some denominations that believe that you can. The Nazarenes historically believe that you can lose your salvation. Come on, it's getting thick. Some people believe that forgiveness comes off in layers. But can I challenge you to think that forgiveness doesn't come off in layers as much as it's fragments of your heart being healed and reintegrated into your soul? What do I mean by this? So, you can legitimately forgive something, right? But then, all of a sudden, you get in front of that person again and you like want to put them in the full Nelson. You ever see that video of the, of the, uh, the, the pastor baptizing, the, like slamming them into the, the deal? I still want to try that sometime, but I, we would definitely get in trouble. But in our culture, we have completely misunderstood this issue of forgiveness. The foundation of forgiveness is you only forgive to the degree you want to be forgiven. Did you catch that? So, if you are totally forgiven, you have no right to hold on to debt. Because now you just stepped into the judge and judging the law. And it says there's one judge, there's one lawgiver, and he says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. That mine doesn't mean you, it's his, right? Because you can misinterpret that. See, he says it's mine. And the enemy is extremely strategic with getting roots of bitterness into us as children thereby totally redefining our reality and our perception by the age of 12. Scientifically, they've proven by the age of 12 years of age, your personality is set. Why in the world do you think the enemy comes in at such an early age and begins to try to twist your perspective of what truth really is? If you think of your wounding, most of you, were wounded the worst at a very young age. Now, not that wounding didn't come later on in life, but the enemy's very strategic because when he can hit you with certain things in the developmental stage of your personality, then it actually opens a gate for a familiar spirit to come in there and then we don't recognize it. So then you're housing another personality. That's actually a spirit. See, it says that double-mindedness means to be two-souled. Are you all with me? I'm not blowing anybody out of the water? Okay. You know, when, when Adam and Eve bit the dust, it was not an apple. There's nothing wrong with apple products. Everything's fine. When Adam and just throw, that's a, you'll sleep better knowing that. Um, but when they, when they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they instantly hid themselves. Why? Because they were absolutely, for the very first time, experiencing a spirit of fear. What did they fear? They feared punishment. All of a sudden, they became aware that they were what? Naked. And instantly, they were introduced to shame, Scripture says, Think about that. They'd never experienced any of that before. They were in perfect union with the Lord. They walked with the Lord in the cool of the day. God literally sat down with Adam and said, whatever Adam named the animal that came in front of him, that was its name. He had the green light. He had dominion. He had authority over the earth. 
And whatever he chose to name it, God was like, wow, that's an amazing name. Snake, no, kill them all. But all the rest of them, yes. Well, maybe not spiders either. Not rabbit trailing? Okay. But what Scripture says that there were skins given. And in the Monday night class, some of you, we, we dove really in-depth into this issue of the skin of Adam before and after and the issue of light. And they were literally cloaked in light before the fall. Whatever that skin was, it was light. The, the Hebrew word for skin is aura. It means light. Skins of light. And... As, as we've gone throughout history and unforgiveness and bitterness and all of this stuff has come in, then dark light has begun to come into the human race. And he says, in the day that you eat, you'll surely die. That's why no one ever lived past a thousand years because he said a thousand years is but a day. And a day is about a thousand years in my life. I mean, in my sight. That Hebrew word for day can mean 12 hours. The Hebrew word for day can mean 24 hours. The Hebrew word for day can mean a season. And so looking at all of this, we, we had, Monday we dove really deep into that, but they never had to forgive before. Think about that. How many times have you had to forgive? Peter was like, Lord, this guy's really getting on my nerve. Give me a way out. Like just like 15 times and then drop the fire of God on him because that'll work. And he's like, no. He goes, 70 times 7, which means what? Like, you know, that's like 490 times in a day, even if you want to get legalistic about it. It's meaning that you forgive totally. But, okay, so who do you know that's, whoo, almost said a fleshly word. Who do you know that's ticked you off 490 times in a day? Besides your spouse. My wife raised her hand. I I thought I beat her to the punch. (laughs) But seriously, who do you know that's ticked you off 490 times in one day? Nobody. Forgiveness is not an option. There's so many lies that surround our thought process when, when it comes to forgiveness. Somehow, we're absolutely convinced that we have these people all packaged up in a little prison inside of our mind and we're not letting them out. <laughs> and, and we're just blasting them with our thoughts off. I can't believe that stupid idiot. They do that again next time I'm getting a baseball bat. And we start, no, oh, come on now, I've seen some of y'all talking to yourselves. <laughs> and we do this. And I, over and over and over when I deal with people on forgiveness, they're like, but you don't know what they did. I can never, and then they put an inner vow in there to really double down. I will never, I vow, I would never forgive them. And you're absolutely convinced that you're punishing that person by not forgiving them. And the truth is, they could give two flying cents that you're bitter towards them. Because if they're not bitter towards you, they're not even thinking about you. Do you understand that? Like, if you're upset with somebody, but they're not upset with you, <laughs> that's, that's your problem. And you're dragging them around like a ball and chain. You've built your own prison. You're the architect of your prison when you choose to hold on to unforgiveness. Now let me tell you something. I've had lots of practice with forgiveness. At the age of five years old, I began to be molested by my uncle. And this went on for a seven-year period. And I did the very spiritual, righteous thing for a long time. I denied and suppressed and called it spirituality. I I said, I had an inner vow that none of that ever affected me. Ever. I was stoic. It worked out really well. And I was introduced, I gave my life to Jesus at 17, and I was introduced 
to um, a book by Charles Stanley. Anybody heard of Charles Stanley? The guy's awesome. And it was called The Gift of Forgiveness. And I'm sitting here at a maximum security prison called Pensacola Christian College. I'm in... <laughs> I thought I'd, I'd get somebody's attention. And, and, I'm, and I'm sitting there, and I'm reading this book, and he begins to say, talk about forgiving people and the ways in which you can forgive them. Well, I couldn't get in front of my uncle to forgive him because my senior year in high school, he stuck a gun in his mouth and, and blew his head off in front of my mom. It wasn't her brother, it was sister's husband. And so I couldn't forgive him to his face. I'll never forget this. I'm in the dorm, nobody's there. By the way, I hadn't shared this part of my testimony in a long time, but I felt the, the Lord say to do that. And, I, and I'm in this chair, and I put this chair in front of me. And I, I literally like picture him in front of me to, to forgive, to bring closure. And I'm telling you what, I didn't see anything in the spirit in that chair, but God came into that room in that moment, and I got hit with fear. I got hit with, you know, anxiety. A part of me wanted to run. A part of me wanted to kill him. Come on, let's get real in this house. Because when you've gone through stuff like that, you, when, when the truth hits, you realize... What's been robbed from your life? The, the depth of the pain. And you go through all these emotions. And I made a conscious decision in that moment to forgive him to the best of my ability. But what each of you have to understand is when you are wounded, depending on the depth of the trauma you've gone through, determines the breakage of your soul. So if I take a glass and I drop it two feet off the ground, there's going to be some pieces to clean up, right? But if I take that same glass and I get on top of a two-story building and I drop it, there's going to be a whole lot of pieces. And that's the same, there's two types of trauma, type A and type B. Sexual, whether it's molestation or abuse, that arena is actually both types of trauma. It's like the perfect storm. And... Psalms 23 is very clear that he restores our soul. So as we walk out this process of healing, all of these broken pieces, Isaiah 61, he came to heal what? The broken heart. To set the captive free. To open the door of the prison. Listen, guys, this issue of molestation, I'm telling you right now, it's way bigger than what you think. And women tend to talk about it more because they, they're just... A, Y'all are just different. Like, you can stay connected to emotion even in the craziest situations, whereas men, you know, you just want to start, like, breaking stuff and, and not thinking about it and, and stay angry. And, you know, that doesn't work either. Been there. And the key to every wounding, the key to every single wounding from every single person, no matter the depth of the trauma no matter the depth of the trespass into your life, the absolute key to open that part of your heart for restoration starts with forgiveness. You have to forgive. It's not an option. Your unforgiveness does not protect you from being hurt like that again. Your unforgiveness does not justify what that person did to you in your life. Your unforgiveness does not keep you from having relationship with Him. Do you understand? When you forgive, that does not restore relationship. You can have healthy boundaries. And here's what we do when, with this issue of forgiveness. We tend to blanket the forgiveness because we really don't want to dive into our heart. We kind of want to do an overview of the wound. Just kind of, yeah. Yeah, it looks pretty ugly there. Yep, yep, there's some anger. Oh, I just heard a cuss word. Yep, not happy about that. And we just stay above our pain. When I, when I deal with people, the whole reason, 
I go, what do you see? What do you feel? What do you hear? So many times they were never allowed to vocalize their pain in that moment. And one of them, whew. And when you get people in a safe place where they can engage their heart, the good, the bad, the ugly, and begin to engage their heart, and they know they're not going to be judged for what they're about to say. And you say, what did that little girl feel? What did that, that little girl want to say? What did that little boy feel? What did he want to say? And you give them permission to have a voice in life. It's one of the most healing things in the world. God knows everything that's in your heart. Everything. There's not a thought you'll ever have that He didn't know before you were even in existence. And that's the truth. And, and while you were in the middle of the worst things in the world, see, listen y'all, life can beat the living daylights out of you and you can stay bitter you can stay resentful and you can get religious and then wound the rest of the world in the name of Jesus. Or we can come into a community and let it all hang out, (laughs) the good, the bad, the ugly, and treat each other like family and love each other and walk alongside of each other through the stuff because that's no longer who you are. Either you are a new creation or you are still an old creation. You can't be a new creation and act like an old creation. The only reason you're still living like the old is because you don't believe you're the new because of all the lies that you haven't dove into. Once again, five pages of notes down the drain. <laughs> Listen, I intentionally hit the line with language sometimes to drive a point. I know you can go overboard, so if you're offended, please forgive me. Try not to do it again. Next Sunday. Um, (laughs) Joke. No, listen. When we get into subjects like this, people, people will leave. It's okay. It's not me. It's the Holy Spirit starts hovering over... Help me, Jesus. The Holy Spirit starts hovering over areas of our lives that we don't want to engage. Everyone in this room has their master's degree in deny and suppress. Like, it just comes second nature. Y'all graduated like ten times. We automatically put distance between us and pain. And, And we all have the ability to check out from our pain in different ways. And I got news for you. From heaven's perspective, if you check out through food, you're no different than somebody else that checks out through alcohol. If you check out through prescription drugs, you're no different than the person that checks out through food. If whatever we use to preserve our life, we're losing it. Listen, sin is sin. Now granted, there's different degrees of consequences in that arena. But sin is sin, y'all. I'm so, I have ministered to leadership for several years now. God continues to bring leaders in the body of Christ into my life. Not just from this region, but beyond. And I see behind the curtain of leadership. And I've spent so many stinking hours crying Because I watch men and women of God build a ministry off of their gifting that their character can't sustain and the ship goes up in flames. Listen. Leaders, if you have, if you have a call to leadership in your life, don't cut the process short. Don't do it, because it doesn't get easier. And, yeah, you, you, you can build an entire ministry off a gift, but I promise you, whatever you're hiding in the closet, the magnifying glass of heaven is going to light you up if you keep it hidden. And that's out of His mercy. you got a generation crying out to be fathered. There's absolutely a generation out there 
that want to see the world change. And I, th- I, think, I think we're in the midst of the greatest move of God ever. And guess what? Some of the most anointed, most loving people are going to be full of tattoos and piercings and they're not going to look the way you want and if you've got a problem with it, get deliverance. I wish the church would be as offended with their empathy and their cold hearts as they are the way somebody's dressed. Listen, y'all. Hey, if, if I can stop wearing plaid, all things are possible. <laughs> L- let me, uh, I want to point out a couple of things as we close here, okay? Hang with me. Oh, man, that was so good. Um, that one of the, okay, real quick, hang with me. The word forgive or forgiveness in the Old Testament, there, there's three Hebrew words, namely kafar, uh, almost sounds like naked, naki. I don't know if I said that right. And uh, select. Kafar and its derivatives appear 154 uh, passages in the Hebrew Bible. And it literally means to cover, to cover over, to overspread. The, uh, the other Hebrew word that I'm sure I butchered, it means a place of shelter. People, when you're sitting in unforgiveness... You've come out of the shelter of the Almighty. And you have opened yourselves up to oppression. You've got to get this. Like, if you put your feet in the dirt and you say, that's it, there's a line that's been drawn, I cannot forgive that, then you put a red light over your head and you tell the demons of hell to come and make their home with you. And that's fact. The last word, um, the, oh, the word uh, nega, uh, uh, yeah, ne- whatever, help me Jesus, is about 650 times, and it means the lifting up, the carrying, the taking away of a burden. And then the last word appears 50 times, and it means... Uh, Forgiveness, forgive, spare, and pardon. So if you you get a picture that when you choose to forgive, you're coming back under a covering without a burden on your back and you've been pardoned of the guilt. Forgiveness is a gift. And I want to encourage you to know that when you choose to forgive, it's a much greater gift to yourself than to the other person because they don't recognize that you're carrying them around in the Spirit. And you truly are carrying them around with you in the Spirit. I want to point out one thing in Matthew 18. Listen, listen to this, and then I'll close. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven... Now watch this. Here's, he's unmasking, he's unveiling secrets. Kingdom, literally, things that have been hidden... Everything Jesus said, these are things that have been hidden from the beginning of time. And he says, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had and payments to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me, and I'll pay you everything. 
And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. You're behind on tithes. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him. That was a joke, sorry. Have patience with me and I'll pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what he had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your, on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he said, pay, I'm sorry, until he should pay all his debts. So also, my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Now, I wish I could reread this in some other version that made it all light and fluffy and everybody went out of here feeling really good about their unforgiveness, but I can't. If you have, and I'm telling you, there's people here that need to forgive. There's no if and buts about it because I know the Lord would not lead me to teach on forgiveness three months after we had just talked about this subject. You may have forgiven someone in your life for one of the debts that you're holding. But when you forgive, you have to take an account of the debts. Do you understand this? So, it would be like this, this quick illustration. If someone broke into my home and they, they punched my kids, they uh, duct taped their mouths closed. I might not be upset about that part, but the punching for sure. And then, and then they, they broke my leg and they, they stole all my Apple products. We're getting serious now then guess what? There's a handful of debts that I would be upset about, right? If I do a blanketed forgiveness, oh Lord, I just forgive that guy. I'll just get a new iPad in Jesus' name. I forgive him. And then the next time I see him, I still want to like, right? You know, that growl comes up, which isn't you, but it's, you know, it's there. And you're upset. And then you're confused to why you're upset because you already forgave them. Here's the reality. From your heart, you have to forgive. So that means there's no flying above the wound zone from a bird's eye view. You dive in because what you feel is really what you believe. You can't have a feeling without a belief. Your emotion is the bridge back to your belief. And that's where double-mindedness comes in because you can know knowledge of God, truth of God all day long, but what you have in here is what you really believe. Because out of the heart, man speaks. Out of the treasures in a man's heart, Jesus said, that comes out. Good treasures, right? Are you all with me? So, you need to take an account of what you're holding against them, which means you've got to take responsibility for what you feel. Listen, y'all, it's high time that we stop being religious and we just get real. This thing's about relationship. And and God's not, he dealt with sin. Like, he didn't play around. When he said it's finished, it's finished. So when you're walking with the Lord, it's actually now about righteousness. And it's actually now about what you don't see that you really are. It's called the divine exchange. You get into this place and all these lies are exposed, and all of a sudden the truth and the reality, because the word truth means reality, and he's a person, he invades that place in your life, and everything changes. And when you get compassion for your enemy, some of y'all have been put in situations you don't want to be in because God's offering you an upgrade in the arena of forgiveness, and you don't want to deal with it. We don't fail in the kingdom. We just retake tests. So if you're, tri- if you're tired of taking the same test, like Holy Spirit's there. That's like, you remember how some of you test time in school? 
you looked over your shoulder maybe to one of the other person's tests that you knew was really smart. I know nobody did that in here, but um, guess what? The Holy Spirit leads and guides you into all truth. The greatest deception is you say, well, I just don't know. That's a guardian lie, and the name I don't know is confusion. Because if you don't know, then that means you don't have to go. And if you don't have to go into that place, then you don't have to feel that pain. That's a form of disassociation. Any of you, that's a third t-shirt, by the way, for those of you making t-shirts. I don't know, doesn't live here. There's a part of you that never forgets anything. Understand that. Listen, the greatest gift some of you could receive right now is letting a person off the hook, totally forgiving them from your heart, letting Jesus be the judge, and asking the Lord to fill your heart with compassion. If we would just, here's, here's this, if we would actually just start t- uh, treating some of our friends the way we're told to treat our enemies, we'd have better friendships. Go back and study the way Jesus said to deal with your enemy. And then look at the way you deal with some of your friends. If the prayer teams could come forward. Listen to me, I just want to encourage y'all. If the Lord can take a kid out of Kankakee, Illinois, that had full-blown anxiety attacks, scared to death to be in public, and, and didn't want to be around people, and got a D in speech class in college, because I could not stand being in front of people because of the fear I would have. If he can change my life, I'm telling you, he can change anybody's life. I know what it's like to walk into a restaurant and want to get out of there because you're absolutely convinced you're going to die because of a full-blown panic attack. I know what it's like to be stuck at 40,000 feet in a plane and be convinced that you're going to die because there's a demon of torment giving you images of the plane crashing nonstop. And perfect love really does drive out all fear because as I recognize more and more by revelation, by experience, that I truly am loved, I'm his favorite. And so are you, by the way. So much of this stuff, perfect love drives out all fear. If you're complete in love, there's no room for torment, y'all. None. Because torment has to do with fear. Right? It's all fear. The atmosphere of hell is fear. So, if, if you need some encouragement to forgive, you need prayer over something, we, we've got these prayer warriors up here. Most of them have forgiven, so they're okay. <laughs> and, uh, no, but don't, listen y'all, we're closing right now, ten minutes late, sorry. But don't leave here hurting. Some of y'all got stirred. Some of y'all need to, to take some debt and give it to the Lord. Let me encourage you to do so, okay? You're safe. I don't care what you've done, what you've gone through. You're in a house of love. Then you're not going to get condemned here. You're going to be loved on, you're going to be encouraged, and you're going to have identity spoken into you because we're family. So, Father, I just thank you for today. I thank you for this house. I thank you for everybody in here. Lord, I thank you for just your love and your compassion. And even when I say rough words with younger kids that were in the room and I didn't realize I said something, you forgive. Thank you, Jesus. Hopefully the parents are. And uh, thank you for everything you're doing. Lord, thank you for just an amazing service, for fellowship, for family, Lord. Thank you for each person here. Lord, some of them have gone through the ringer beyond what we could even dream or imagine, but you're greater. You healed it. They're new, no matter what.
They're a new creation. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Thank you for listening. For more messages and other resources, please subscribe to this podcast or go to our website at www.crosskingdom.org.